Bada bing, bada boom. This one's a doozy. I don't even know what to tell you. Mr. Kim Chol was standing at the big screen in the middle of the busy airport in Malaysia. And lucky for us, since what's about to go down is happening in a busy airport, we have all the CCTV footage of one of the most insane murders that we've ever covered to date. But back to Mr. Kim Chol. He had just checked in his bag. He's standing there hands-free. All he has is this black backpack that's slung over one shoulder. This black backpack is going to be very important, so keep this in mind. Now, he had just been on a solo trip to Malaysia. It was fun, but he's itching. He's itching to go back home to his wife and kids in China, in Macau, China. His eyes are scanning the rows and rows of like brightly flashing numbers, the flight numbers, and he finds his. He memorizes the gate number. He turns on his heel, and right as he's turning, he hears footsteps behind him. But, I mean, that's to be expected. It's an airport. But it's almost like these um, pitter-patter footsteps, like, like someone's running up behind him. Maybe someone is missing their flight. Someone's late. What's that got to do with him, right? But suddenly, suddenly he can't see. Someone's mm-hmm. hands are covering his eyes. Like, if you were to run up to your boyfriend and you're trying to be cute, you put your ar- hands around his eyes and you're like playing peekaboo, right? Guess who? It's like a K-drama moment. But he knew that his entire family, all of his friends, they were in China. As far as he knew, there was nobody that he knew in Malaysia. There was, there was no one who would know him to do this. Before he had time to turn around, another set of hands grabbed his face this time. Like, kind of covered his mouth. It's almost like someone slapped him without the impact. He felt someone's fingernail uncomfortably poke into his nose, and he tried to grab at whatever was touching his face. He ends up grabbing an arm. And he opens his eyes, and he sees this young woman standing in front of him. And he's so puzzled, he'd never seen this girl before, and she looks really young. And all she can say is, sorry, sorry, she breaks free from his grasp, And suddenly, these two girls, they're gone. Whoever they were, they ran up to him, played peekaboo, touched his face a couple times, and they were running off. How old are they? Like Like early 20s. They look really young. Yeah. He stood there really confused. Just like, what the hell just happened? Like, what the hell is wrong with girls these days? Like, stupid kids. And then it started to burn. Like, his whole face started to burn. Wherever they had touched him with their hands, it started to hurt. He reaches up trying to touch his face, and he's thinking, okay, maybe one of the girl's fingernails dug into my nose, and that's why it stings so much. But that doesn't make sense because my eyes feel like they're about to be on fire. My retinas feel like there is an inferno raging inside of them, like a bonfire. Maybe there was something on their hands, like some sort of alcohol residue or something, because why would it burn? Kim Chol beelined it straight to the airport's medical center. He told the receptionist that someone had come up behind him, attacked him, and now his face is burning and it was very hard to see. He didn't know Malay, but he knew a little bit of English and he hoped that she would understand, so he kept screaming, very painful, very painful, I was sprayed liquid. The Mm. first thought everyone had was, maybe it's acid, maybe this is an acid attack. The receptionist looked carefully, but his skin didn't seemed like something had happened it looked normal so it didn't seem like acid and he was walking and talking just fine so she did not think that he was in mortal imminent danger his eyes were a little bit red but maybe something got into it so she hit the call button and said okay mr chol we're gonna wait for the next doctor to be with you it's an airport hospital we don't have a full staff please sit down He sits down in the waiting room and after a few minutes the receptionist peeks over her desk mr chol is not sitting up in the chair anymore He slumped down, shoulders below the top of the back seat, almost falling out of his chair. He looks like a drunk man. His head is kind of tilted to the side. He was unconscious. The nurse is pressing the emergency call button. She's rushing out from behind the desk. She takes inventory of the situation, and it's bad. He has tense muscles, ragged, shallow breathing. He's not responding to any verbal or physical cues or stimuli. Within seconds, an ambulance was at the door, ready to take him to the nearest major hospital. They slipped an oxygen mask over his face. His whole body was unresponsive and limp. In the span of 30 minutes, this man, Kim Chol, had been murdered in broad daylight at a busy airport. That's not even the strange part. That is the tip of the iceberg, okay? The attack in the airport by these two female assassins lasted less than three seconds. It was perfectly synchronized. Two women had delivered a fatal dose of one of the deadliest poisons known to mankind by smearing it on their hands and thus smearing it on his face. 
This poison had been outlawed by the Chemical Weapons Convention in a treaty signed by just about every single country on planet Earth, including Malaysia. Governments were not even allowed to stockpile this weapon. It was that dangerous. The U.S. at one point had a big stockpile, and after they signed this treaty, they dumped it in the ocean. They put it on a bunch of ships and sank the ship no deep way. in the ocean. This is a man-made weapon, a chemical weapon of mass destruction. And it's like baby oil, just an oily substance. But now it had been used to kill this random man in an airport. More curious than that is, I mean, why did the two women kill him? Are they unhinged? What happened? These two women had never met each other before, before this exact moment that they had worked flawlessly to murder a random innocent passerby. They could have targeted the young woman walking out a baggage claim. They could have targeted the mother with her stroller nearby. Why did they choose this man? Was it random? Maybe not. The authorities opened this man's, well, now dead man's, black backpack, the only thing that he had on his body, and they found four different passports, all fake. Four bricks of $100 bills totaling to over $100,000 US dollars. Wow. And get this. 12 vials of a substance called atropine. Atropine is the antidote to the same very toxic, very illegal chemical weapon that was just used to kill him. What? Exactly. What is going on? So many questions. The authorities didn't even know exactly who this man was for a minute there because he had four fake passports in his bag. Well, it turns out, and it's very quick to get to this, but uh, turns out this guy's real name wasn't Kim Chol, like it was on his passports or his fake IDs. His name was Kim Jong-nam. Sound familiar? Older brother to Kim Jong-un and original heir to the North Korean dictatorship. No freaking way. He had just been murdered by two girls who would swear it was an accident. These two girls would be known as assassins, but they came out and swore to the world that they thought that they were part of a YouTube prank video. They claimed that they just wanted to be YouTube famous. They had no intention of killing anyone and especially not the dictator of North Korea's older brother. This is absolutely, on another level, unreal. If this was a movie, I would say this is unbelievable and stupid. But this yeah. is real life. The two girls said random men had approached them offering to pay them money to be a part of their YouTube prank videos. All they had to do was go up to strangers and touch their face with baby oil on their hands. So did these two random girls who wanted to be on YouTube really assassinate a member of the Kim dynasty in North Korea? Or is there a lot more to the story? This is the story of the world's most unexpected female assassins. As always, full show notes are available at RottenMangoPodcast.com. We are talking about North Korea today. I feel absolutely, a thousand percent, completely, totally safe. Yes, I do. <laughs> Which is why I'm letting you know that if I suddenly stop posting videos, maybe you should be worried. Maybe I should be worried. We're all worried over here, okay? But it's fine. It's okay. I don't know. Positivity. Optimism might be the end of me, but I'm, I'm telling you, before we get into this story, North Korea as a whole, like as a country, as a unit, has denied any and all conclusions that you may come up with about this case. They basically said, hey, you, whatever you're thinking I did, I didn't do it. So what are you going to do about it? So um, I'm just going to give you the information, but you're connecting the dots at your own risk and any and all conclusions are alleged. So with that being said, let's get into it. Are they aspiring YouTubers or are they female assassins? That's the question the whole world wants to know. Because the YouTubers that they're working for, the men that hired them to do these YouTube pranks, who are they? Well, come to find out, they're North Korean spies. But how much of that did the two girls know? So let's talk about the two girls. Sidi was from a remote farming village in Indonesia with a population of about like 500 people. It's likely that the water buffalo outnumbered the villagers in this town. Like that's how small it was. 
Her neighbor said that she was a very quiet and religious child. Her father was really involved in the mosque and she was kind of like his um like his mini me. He was responsible for seeing the call to prayer at the mosque, which happens like five times a day. So when he's not doing that, he was selling spices. And after Sidi went through school, which only went up to the sixth grade in their village, she worked with him at home. She was bundling up spices to sell to the other villagers. She worked really hard. But at the end of the day, she would go to sleep at night thinking, okay, there's got to be more to life. Like, this can't be it. Are you kidding? The world is so big. I don't want to look at more suitable water buffaloes than potential husbands. I want to go see, I want to go see people. I want to see the world. So she dreamed of a bigger life and she just had a single goal. Her whole life goal was she wanted to buy her parents a house to retire on so that they wouldn't have to work. They could be comfortable. Sidi is 14 when she decides to move out of the village and move to the capital. A relative told her that they could get her a job in Jakarta. She was so excited to finally work towards her dream. She packs all of her things, moves to Jakarta, travels all the way there, and sees that the job waiting for her is a sweatshop. And she's looking around. She's standing in the middle of this huge warehouse with a bunch of tired women that are just sitting on these cheap plastic stools in front of desks that are barely big enough to even fit a sewing machine. There was a cushion on the stool, though. She felt like that was a positive. But at least she would be making money, right? I mean, it's not the most glamorous job, but it, it's something. So she sucked up her pride, got to work. She worked 16-hour days every single day, no weekends, no windows. And at the end of the month, she would send all the money back home to her parents. She did this for two years. The other ladies at the sweatshop felt like she just didn't talk enough. She was very shy. She kept to herself, never did any small talk. But after a year or so of working there, all the women started whispering about her. You know, I saw her at the market with the sweatshop's owner's son. That's crazy. Within months of dating, she ends up getting married to the owner's son. She was still 16 at the time, and a lot of these older women, they were whispering, you know, what, what do you think made them want to get married so bad? Why were they rushing? Soon enough, they had their answer. CD had given birth to a baby boy. The sweatshop went bust in 2010, so CD and her family, like her new husband and her son, they moved to Malaysia for better work opportunities. Her husband tries working at restaurants, and CD doesn't have any prior work experience. All she had was the sweatshop, and there were no jobs for her in Malaysia. A single waiter salary is nowhere near enough to support the both of them and the baby. So what does she do? She's 18. She thinks of the only way to put food on the table. She gets into work. Now, the family was able to keep afloat for a bit, but this is the sad part. CD wasn't even doing this because she enjoyed it. Like, she's doing it to put food on the table to support her family. One day she comes home from work, her husband slaps divorce papers down on the table. She moves back to her village with her baby, and she just feels like, I had a taste of that big city life. I went through the motions. I saw these professionals. I saw these big, tall buildings that look like they're going to touch the sky. I saw these people living in these fancy, luxurious apartments, and I want that life. And like coming back to the village now, it's just not doing it for me. And she felt like, not only do I want that life, but I want my son to have that life. So she sends her son with the husband or the ex-husband to be raised. She just felt like there were more opportunities that way. And CD keeps thinking of ways that she's going to get back into Malaysia and get back into the workforce. And once she gets back, again, she finds out that the only available jobs for her with her work experience and connections were in the industry. So she starts off as a spa masseuse. She slowly rises to doing online escorting. She charges almost her entire sweatshop monthly wage for one session. And she's finally making enough kind of to live and to send money back to her parents every single month. She also traveled back home to Indonesia every single month because Indonesians don't need a visa to stay in Malaysia. So as long as they're there for less than 30 days, it's fine, which means every 30, 28 days or so, she would have to leave the country and then re-enter. So she would go back to Indonesia and she said that it was just rough. Like, yes, she was sending money home to her parents, but she was basically living a double life. She kept her work a secret from her family her parents went to the mosque every single week and gave thanks for their daughter's success in the big city and since they're so religious and since they're so proud of her she just i mean there was just no way for her to tell them the truth and she knew that if she told them how she was making this money how she was sending it they would immediately make her come back to the village where they would take care of her try to protect her try to shield her from these things so she would sit there and listen to them thank Allah for giving them a daughter that worked so hard for the family. She just, I don't know, she said it was a very complicated feeling. 
And it broke her heart to keep this secret. And her one goal was, I want to give my parents everything. But one day, I'm going to build a real career. I'm going to do something outside of sex work. And I can move on from this so that I don't have to feel like I'm living a double life. So when a friend introduced her to a taxi driver who said that he could get her an acting job, CD is through the moon. I mean, she was skeptical, yeah, but she can't afford to pass up an opportunity like this. The taxi driver is not the one hiring. He said, you know, I gave this ride to this, I think he was Japanese, a Japanese man named James. He said that he's he got this huge YouTube channel, works for a production company, and they're going to make YouTube pranks. So this is like in 2017 where YouTube pranks were the it thing. Wait, this happened 2017? Yes. This is when Are like Are you kidding the, me? I, why, I don't know why I thought this happened like 25 years ago. No. Like YouTube pranks were the it thing back in the day. In 2017, like all those elevator YouTube pranks were raging, like all of that. Wow. So it kind of made sense. Everyone was like, oh yeah, everyone's putting money into YouTube pranks right now. So this Japanese guy named James is like, hey, taxi driver, here's my card. If you ever find future actresses who want to be part of my YouTube videos, just have them call me. So CD's like, okay, absolutely. She calls James's number and she meets up with him. Now, you probably already guessed it. James is no Japanese man. He's a North Korean spy. They met for the first time January of 2017, a little over a month before Kim Jong-nam's death. On the day of the meeting, CD took a short, like, selfie video of her and James, which becomes vital evidence later. This was not anything new for CD. She dreamed of making it in the industry. She dreamed of acting and quitting sex work, and she documented her entire journey. Like, this was the very first step. She hoped that someone would see these videos and maybe cast her as, like, a minor character in a minor role, and then eventually that would lead to something bigger and bigger, and then she would have a job that her parents would be proud about. That was her new dream. James did not speak any Indonesian, so they had to use Google Translate to communicate, but it was pretty clear. She was going to get paid about $100 per prank. James introduced her to his cameraman, who would also be there during all of these pranks, and he was going to film everything. James would stay hidden, and CD would be the one facilitating the pranks to these random strangers. James also introduced her to the YouTube channel boss. His name was Mr. Chang. So whereas James was very shy and reserved, Mr. Chang was outgoing, friendly, even a little flirtatious with CD. He knew Indonesian, Japanese, Korean. I mean, CD was very impressed by this man. She thought, no wonder he's the brains behind this whole thing. He seems like an entrepreneur. He seems like a go-getter. Mr. Chang is just another one of the North Korean spies. There were eight North Korean spies on this um, alleged mission. Every man in this operation is a North Korean spy, but CD had no freaking clue. Neither did Doan. So Doan is the other actress. They don't know each other. CD and Doan had never met prior to this. They're not even from the same country. They don't even speak the same language. Doan was also from a small rural farming village, but she was from Vietnam. She was the baby of the family. Her father treasured her so much, like any award that she ever got in school, like even like the participation awards, her father would frame it and put it in this waterproof accordion folder so that nothing would ever, ever happen to it. He was so lucky. He just felt so blessed that he had this incredibly well-behaved child, a good student who was never troublesome. I mean, people describe her as being... Very peaceful and gentle. That's how she's described. She graduated from public school and got accepted into the private university in Hanoi, the capital of Vietnam. She moved alone to the big capital and dedicated herself to studying. Some sources say that she studied pharmacy. Others say it was accounting. But they all say that she was unable to find a job after graduating. So she gets a temporary job waiting tables at a local pub and she starts modeling. I mean, everyone at this pub is like, you are literally so freaking pretty. You need to get into modeling right now. Here, I've got a connection. They're looking for a small time model. So she takes on a couple of gigs. She's an aspiring actress now. She auditioned for the Vietnam Idol, which is the Vietnamese version of American Idol. And on her social media accounts, she went by her stage name, Ruby Ruby. So just like CD, Doan heard about the YouTube actress job through a friend of a friend. Now, in December of 2016, two months before Nam's death, Doan's friend brought Doan to a bar in downtown to meet the recruiter, Mr. Y. This is a different guy from James and Mr. Chang, the one that recruited CD. okay? Mm -hmm. Mr. Y was dressed in a fancy tailored suit. He spoke fluent Vietnamese. He acted like a very legitimate producer. He was also in his 30s, Doan was in her 20s, and he took her around the city and he would show her his favorite spots. He texted her good morning after he woke up and good night before he went to bed. 
He took her shopping, bought her Christmas gifts, even took her to the aquarium one day because she said that she was bored. They took pictures together in front of the fish tanks and he would take her hand through the exhibits. It it started to feel like some sort of relationship. Doan was starting to fall for this man and it seemed like he was falling for her, but they would still do a couple of jobs here and there. The first prank took place at a busy supermarket. The objective was to kiss a stranger on the cheek and run away. Doan was so freaking nervous, okay? I mean, she was so freaked out. I mean, when she got there, heard the objective and saw all the people, she had all these butterflies in her stomach. I mean, she's normally a very shy person. Like, I get it, she wants to make it in the industry, but she's very shy. They try filming the prank a couple of times, but every time Doan would chicken out and she's like, I can't do it, I can't do it. Mr. Y was very nice about it. He and his cameraman would scrap the shoot. They'd say, okay, it's fine. Why don't we just go out for drinks instead? So they'd go to the bar, take a couple shots. Dawn would say that she would get pretty drunk, but not blacking out. And then one time, Mr. Y and the cameraman took her to the next door over, which was a North Korean restaurant. So, okay, it specifically wasn't advertised as a North Korean restaurant, but there are allegedly hundreds of North Korean restaurants in Vietnam that allegedly function as a way for North Korea to get foreign currency and are also allegedly a hub for spies. Interesting, okay? Everyone in the area kind of knew it was a North Korean restaurant. But she didn't know. She knew. Oh, she knew. Yeah. Okay. But I mean, it's just a restaurant. It's not like okay. you go in and you got to get shipped to North Korea, right? Doan says that she thinks they took her to this restaurant in order to see if she would chicken out or not want to go in or would say something bad about North Korea or would discriminate against the food. Maybe they felt like if she did, she wasn't right for the job. But she didn't say well, her anything. Her life was on the line. Yeah. <laughs> like- Like, she didn't say anything. She didn't hesitate. She didn't act weird. I mean, it's just a restaurant, like, that serves kind of North Korean food that's rumored to have North Korean spies, but whatever, right? She ate the food. She acted normal. So they continued with her. They tried a couple more pranks, and Mr. Y would get her to get a big stuffed teddy bear for her to practice pranks on, and she did, and she was slowly getting braver. Mr. Y told her the next one would be international. He asked for her passport. She gave it to him, and he flew her out to Malaysia and Cambodia to practice more pranks. Doan was enamored. I mean, this feels like she's, I imagine this is like what dating Mr. Beast feels like, like getting flown out to do a YouTube video. It feels very like fancy fancy and oh my gosh, I'm making steps in my career. This is like exciting. She was getting flown out internationally to act in these viral YouTube videos. I mean, she's already a model and now her dream of becoming an actress is becoming more and more close. It's becoming more and more true and feasible. Now, on the other hand, so Dawn is practicing on a teddy bear. She's doing these random pranks in public. CD was kind of going through the same thing, but a little bit different. She's working with the North Korean spies, James and Mr. Chang. They would meet her in a predetermined public location, which was almost always busy with people. And it was it was a bit less romantic. Mr. Y took this almost romantic approach to the whole thing. Mm. These two guys, they did not. They would pay her the money and typically she would walk up to a stranger, hold their hand. I feel like we've seen these on TikTok Mm. with, you know, the elevator video or the escalator videos. So she'd walk up to a stranger, hold their hand. They would turn around, look at her and then she would say, sorry, sorry. And run off. That's so scary now. Now yes. you think about it. It's like after you're hearing about this, man, I don't want people touching my hand, you know, because yeah. you don't know what's on there. Like as a YouTuber, I would be scared to film these because I don't know what people's reactions are going to be. Of course. And I don't know if they're going to overreact or th- yeah. not overreact, but yeah. so then she would run away. CD herself said, I didn't really think that the jokes were that funny, but hey. I'm getting paid $100 a prank. There must be an audience. There must be people that are watching this because what the hell, right? Sometimes they would smear CD's hand with lotion before the prank. Keep this in mind, okay? So they would smear her hand with lotion and they would say, okay, go up to that stranger and wipe the lotion on their face. She would do it and it almost never escalated to the point of someone hurting her or getting mad at her. Almost everyone just seemed confused and silently angry. Then they would escalate. They would say, hey, put this baby oil on your hands and play peekaboo with that random stranger. So she would run up to a random man and they would always pick the person that they wanted her to approach. Mm -hmm. She would run up to the random man, put her hands, cover his eyes. And then when he turned around, she would say, sorry, sorry, and then run off. There was always a cameraman that was hiding in the corner filming the whole thing. And with every escalation, which from the nothing to the baby lotion to the baby oil, she would get paid more and more. 
And with the life that CD had, this was comparatively easy money. She could do the prank and then apologize and run away afterwards. She hadn't run into anyone that had like a black belt yet or that had crazy anger issues. So she felt like, okay, I guess I'm not really hurting anyone and the pranks are harmless. So at least I can send money back to my parents. That's how she justified it. And James and Mr. Chang promised her at the end of the day, these videos were the in into the entertainment industry. You get into the YouTube prank videos and then soon you're going to win an Oscar. That's what they're telling her. You're going to become a famous actress. In hindsight, they weren't wrong about the famous part. CD would become internationally known. February 13 of 2017, Mr. Chang was walking through an airport. He's not running, but he's, he's walking pretty fast. He's walking with a purpose. He had somewhere to be, right? He walks up to one of those cafes that are before the airport security line. So it's technically open to anyone. You don't need a boarding pass. You don't need to get through security. It's just before you go into the airport or maybe you're saying bye to a loved one. So he sits there and he meets up with a young woman, Seedy. Seedy is patiently waiting for him. She had gotten a text for this airport location and she thought that she was here just to film another YouTube prank video. I mean, this is what she's been doing for the past month, getting paid to go meet at an undetermined, very public location. And he would point at a couple of people. She would run up and put some baby oil on their face, get paid a couple hundred bucks. She had already ordered her coffee. She was sitting down waiting for him. He didn't even bother ordering anything. He just walked right up to her and explained the game plan. Today, we've got a new prank. Okay, it's kind of like the lotion prank, but a little bit different. Here's the idea. We're going to put some, um, we're going to put a blend to the peekaboo prank and the baby oil prank. So I'm going to cover your hands with oil and maybe some lotion later. You're going to walk up to people that we point at and cover their eyes. Easy peasy, right? Okay, sounds good. Do you have a target in mind already? Now, he usually did. Mr. Chang almost always did. He said that he would pick out the person who looked most likely to give a strong reaction but not call the police. That's what he told CD. He said it's all about the YouTube views. It's all about the YouTube engagement. That meant he would go after normal, non-scary, non-intimidating looking adults. Oh, and here he comes. Don't make it obvious, but behind you, 5 o'clock, gray suit jacket, black backpack. CD reached behind her and pretended to fiddle with her bag strap. She glanced up and sure enough, there was this kind of portly looking man with that was walking briskly through the airport. He was stopping to look at the list of departure gates. She turned back to Mr. Chang. Okay, got it. And the lotion? No, we're going to do oil this time. Here. He takes the bottle out of his bag and pours a little bit on CD's hands. She's like, oh God, it's slimy. Well, yeah, don't touch your face or your clothes with it. It's going to stain. So go up to him cover his eyes, and run away when he turns around. Right now? In a second. I need to set up the camera. He's over there somewhere, the cameraman. But there's another actress this time too. She's going to do the same thing, but she's going to come up from the front and cover his mouth. He's going to think that he's getting kidnapped. It's going to be so good for the video. I've got another team at another cafe location to get all the angles with another cameraman. Oh, and you can wash your hands afterwards. There's bathrooms by the doors. CD looks at her coffee cup that she's not going to be able to finish because she's got oil all over her hands now. What a shame. And Mr. Chang's other team consisted of two men who are currently at a cafe on the other side of the airport, and they were in their places ready for action. On the other side of Terminal 2, Mr. Y was talking alongside Doan and a couple other North Korean spies, keeping a lookout. Right before 9 a.m., all actors and crew take their places. The girls are hidden behind columns on opposite sides of the check-in desk. And minutes later, when Mr. Chol walks through the doors, C.D. Doan and all of the North Korean spies track him with their eyes. The girls wait for their signals. Mr. Chang gives the signal. C.D. runs out from behind the pillar and towards... Kim Jong-nam, we're going to call him Nan. He turned the other way, but he didn't see her coming. He just heard her steps. And in less than three seconds, he felt a pair of small hands covering and smearing oil onto his eyes and face. He's like, what the hell? Mr. Y gave the signal that he saw City rush out. Less than a second after CD, Doan approaches Nam from the front and she places her hands on top of his face, almost like a on top of his mouth and nose. Why do they need two girls? Is it like oh, a insurance? Oh, there's a reason. So after CD covers his eyes and she walks away saying, sorry, sorry, Mr. Y gives the signal. And Doan comes out from her side of the pillar, which is now in front of Kim Jong-nam. Mm-hmm. She walks up to his face and kind of places her hand on his face, like covering his mouth and his nose. And in less than three seconds, he felt two pairs of hands just all over his face. And he has no idea what the hell is going on. 
What's his like reaction? His reaction is like, what the fork is wrong with these girls? So he's not alarmed. I don't think he's alarmed to the sense like I'm being attacked. I think it was more of like, so, like who do these little girls think they are like messing with me right now? Mm, like maybe he thought, I don't know if he confused. went as far to think it's a YouTube video, but I would imagine it's kind of how we would react of like, are we getting pranked right now? Like this is really weird. Yeah, yeah, okay. They didn't seem like these crazy assassins. He's not thinking, oh my gosh, they're going to kill me. It's just like, who are these little girls? Like, what are they doing to my face? So he grabs Doan's arms because she wasn't able to leave fast enough. CD was able to run off. And he's <laughs> like, who are you? She's like, sorry, sorry. She wiggles out of his grip and runs away. CD is long gone at this point, and the both of them, they make a beeline for the nearest bathroom to wash the oil off their hands. This, again, is all caught on CCTV. What the girls didn't know was how close to death that they were that day. Instead of baby oil or lotion this time, because you were asking, why are there two girls involved? The chemical on their hands were two different components of a chemical called VX, Venomous Agent X. This sounds like it's out of a Marvel movie, but it's real. VX is an odorless, tasteless, amber-colored liquid that has the same density of water, but it's oily. If you were to see a bottle of it, you would think that it's apple juice, but in oil form. Maybe you would think it's like dirty frying oil. If you inhale it, if it touches your skin, if it goes into your nervous system and any way possible in a matter of minutes it breaks the connection between your brain and your muscles what does that mean suddenly your body feels like it weighs a thousand pounds and you cannot move a single muscle your arms and your legs go limp and you can't even move your diaphragm so your diaphragm is what makes you breathe the diaphragm sits below just below the lungs and it contracts in and out which pushes air in and out of your lungs but now, with that paralysis, your diaphragm isn't moving and you can't force it open and you can't force it closed. You're suffocating and you can't move. That's how it kills you. Mm, oh, wow. It's not fun. It's painful. The UN classified VX as a weapon of mass destruction and stockpiling more than 3.53 ounces, that's a very little amount, of it per year has been internationally outlawed since 1993. This treaty has been signed by almost every single country in this entire planet in the world. It has been used as a chemical weapon in a few different occasions in Cuba, Iraq, Japan, to name a few. In the Japan attack, Masami, he was part of the new religious group that we talked about, the subway bombings mm -hmm. or the subway attacks he was part of that religious group that cult he sprinkled vx onto the neck of a suspected spy and he killed them it's pretty bad another fun fact about vx um the u.s used to have a stockpile of it until 1996 when the government banned it because they signed the treaty so how did we get rid of it the military employed the good old chase technique aka cut holes and sink them chase AKA, they filled old boats with this deadly chemical weapon, pushed it out deep into the Atlantic, and then sank their ships. They sank a total of 124 tons of VX into the Atlantic. Jeez. I mean, it's better than using it on people, right? But I mean, in the Atlantic. 124 tons? Yeah. I can't even give you a calculation on how many people 124 tons of VX could have killed if it, if it was in the wrong hands. Oh my God. That's horrifying to think about. Yeah. And uh, it's speculated that less than a pinhead size drop, pinhead size drop can guarantee death. So think about how much damage 125, I mean, you could wipe out an entire nation, maybe even the world. Let me give you a scarier statistic, okay? North Korea has somewhere between two and a half to 50,000 tons of VX. North Korea has about 45 million times the legal dose allowed to be held by any country in the world. And if you already were kind of questioning humanity, this is all human made. It's a synthetic chemical. It's man made. Humans are really out here ruining everything. It is said to be one of the most toxic, if not the most toxic substance on earth in all of history, courtesy of mankind. CD and Doan were given a dollop of this substance on their hands. They were told to go up to their target and smear it on his face while they film it. It would be a hilarious prank for their YouTube channel, they said. Look, I too was wondering, how the hell did these two girls not plop dead? Mm -hmm. Like, how, what? So think of VX as being able to be broken down into two components, both in oil form. So you have one half of VX, let's say the V, then you have the X. That's not how it works, but just to make it easy to visualize, right? Now, those two together, deadly. By itself, not deadly. 
That's freaking crazy. So think of it as halves. Each girl has half the formula. And when the two are mixed on his face, they form the deadly combination. So, so when Dong was the second one touching it, that oh, means yeah. she has that thing on her hand now. Yes. Let me explain, okay? So CD would have one component smeared on her hand that is not lethal. She swipes it on Kim Jong Nam's face, runs to the bathroom to wash it off. Don would come up with a second component, smear it on his face, combining both of them on the surface of his face would result in his death, and also Don would have some of that residue of deadly VX on her hand since she was the second girl to go up, meaning she could yeah. die, right? How did she not die? Just pure luck. Pure luck. CD did not feel any effects because she did not have both components. Don, on the other hand, had both, but um, she just ran to the bathroom. Both girls said it just felt really slimy and gross. It was very unpleasant. It's not even just like oil on your hands. It was just really nasty. And there was almost like this weird gassy smell to it. They didn't like it. It sounded like if Don like touched her face a bit. Oh, that's oh. over, right? I mean, game over. So there was like two strokes of luck in this situation. So the first stroke of luck is that Don saw a bathroom right next to where she had done this pretty much, like on the other side of the lobby. So she half ran towards it, not wanting to look suspicious. There was no line, which is usually not a thing at airport bathrooms. So she just went right in and washed her hands. Now, a thing about VX is that it is very dangerous, okay? But it's also completely able to be washed off with some good old soap and water. Don did not experience more than the tiny effects of VX because she was able to wash it off in time. And then the second stroke of luck was that the skin on your hands is part, some of the thickest skin that you have on your whole body. So it would take much, much longer for it to seep into her body. Kim Jong Nam would not have this luck on his side. He felt the effects within a minute. The quantity of oil on his face was much higher than the pin drop lethal dose. And face skin is actually very thin, especially around the eyes is some of the thinnest parts of skin on your whole body. It's been said by experts that the fastest way to absorb VX into the bloodstream would be through eye mucus. You get it a little bit in your eye. Mm -hmm. Your eye is basically an extension of your brain just goes straight into the bloodstream so i guess my question is does he know at that moment since he's from north korea he had no idea because he has 12 vials of the antidote in his backpack why does he have that he anticipated this yes he had no clue who these girls were he had no clue what they had put on him he probably thought it was some sort of rubbing alcohol or some sort of acid. If he had known it was VX, he had 12 vials of the antidote right on his back. And instead of using it, he rushed to the medical center. That is crazy. Yeah. Wow. So he's anticipated to run yes. into these type of scenario during this trip. Not even just this scenario, but he just anticipated that his brother would kill him. Because I thought that he thought maybe North Korea was trying to kill him or someone who hates North Korea was trying to kill him. Kim Jong-nam had been telling all of his friends for the past six months prior to his death that his brother, the North Korean dictator, was out to get him. But why would this guy want his brother dead? Why would Kim Jong-un want his brother dead? None of this would have happened if not for Disneyland. You're like, what the hell does North Korea have to do with Disneyland? Just about everything, okay? Kim Jong-nam, the one that was murdered at the airport, aka Nam, he had been primed his whole life to take over. He was the eldest son of his dad slash the former dictator. He was going to be the next dictator after his dad. It was his birthright. At this point, he had gotten married. He had several kids. He was being groomed by his dad to take over. So this is when um, Kim Jong-un is not the dictator yet. Their father is the dictator. And he's picking out which son is going to be the heir. And it was most likely going to be Nam. He's the eldest son. He's the firstborn. It just kind of made sense. But he did have some problems. Okay. So his mom was his dad's mistress. And she had just recently defected from North Korea and moved to Russia, which made things a little bit tense. between The, the mom? Yeah. Between Kim Jong-nam and his father. And on top of that, he's not really impressing his dad at work. He's a little bit too liberal for his father's liking. Allegedly, he was influenced by his education in Switzerland. Did you know, like, the whole Kim family goes to Switzerland to study? So, like, you would just be going to school with... Kim Jong-un's kids? Yeah, and Kim Jong-un went to Switzerland to study oh. abroad. As a kid, yeah. That is something. But Imagine you don't know. being classmates with them. 
Exactly. You don't know that they're the, they're the dictator's kids. Oh. So Switzerland is one of the very few countries that has a North Korean embassy. And so the Kim family would send their kids and they would pretend to just be a son of an employee from the North Korean embassy. And it said that they got along really well with the South Korean kids. The kids of employees from the South Korean embassy. So there's a lot to unpack here, okay? A lot to unpack. But it's said that Kim Jong-nam was a little bit too liberal. And he would he would frequently question North Korea's political and economic system. So much to the point where his dad, the dictator, was like, Hey, do you want to, I don't know, spend a week or two in the coal mines? Because you're pissing me off. AKA, let me put you in a concentration camp. So things were a little bit tense, okay? But he was still in the line for the power seat. He was first in line until Disneyland. May of 2001, Kim Jong-nam took his youngest son to Disneyland. He only took one son. It was supposed to be like a father and son bonding day. They got tickets for Disneyland in Tokyo, Japan, which is a lot closer to North Korea than like the one in the States. Plus like traveling to the United States. Kim Jong-nam was pretty radical, but he's not like that crazy. That's that's freaking insane. So they get on the plane. Everything's going well. Are they all like secret identity? Yeah, they've got like a million fake passports and they're really good. But uh, he gets arrested at the Tokyo airport for his fake passport in front of his son. And there's so many layers to how embarrassing this was. It was a passport from the Dominican Republic. And his name was listed as Pangsheng Fat Bear in Chinese. In Chinese? Say Fat Bear in Chinese. Pangsheng. Yeah, that was his name. And so that (sighs) kind of made him a laughing stock of like, really, you got a fake passport and your name is Fat Bear? Like, it's a, it's kind of weird. It's, you would not expect that from a dictator family, right? Now, that's not the part that people were upset about. North Korea was so upset because Disneyland is the shining jewel. It is the epitome. It is the symbol of the prosperous capitalism of the Western world, aka North Korea's greatest enemy is the Western world. And Disneyland is basically its little mascot it doesn't matter if they were going to disneyland in japan so this news pissed them off yeah so for the heir to sneak into disneyland with a fake passport under the name fat bear of all things is too embarrassing it's too embarrassing for kim jong-il to take kim jong-il is the dad right and nam went from heir apparent to disgraced son in a matter of hours Had this Disneyland trip never happened, Kim Jong-nam might be the heir and current supreme leader of North Korea right now, and he might not have been killed in an airport for a YouTube prank video. But because of Disneyland, he never got his chance at the throne. Instead, his little half-brother, Kim Jong-un, would take over. Now, it's speculated that Kim Jong-un would have every reason to want Kim Jong-nam dead. His own brother, his own flesh and blood, dead. We uh, covered a bit of the Kim dynasty and their wild parties in an episode covering the kidnapping of a famous South Korean actress. Do you guys remember that one? Mm -hmm. It's like, um, that one was so unhinged. What happens when you have a dictator that's super into action movies and wants to make his own movies but fill it with propaganda for his country that he held hostage? Well, that dictator kidnaps a South Korean actress and her director husband to produce films for him, basically at gunpoint. Unhinged, I can't believe that was real either. But that's Kim Jong-un's dad. And we're not going to talk about him too much today. But North Korea is right now on the third generation of dictators. First, there was Kim Il-sung. And he was the first one. The man in power right after the Korean War. When North Korea became its own country, he started the dictatorship. He had the the throne, the seat of power. Then it was passed to his son, Kim Jong-il. And the choice was easy. He had three kids. Kim Jong-il was the only son, so he won. Kim Jong-il was um, not a great guy. Are we surprised? He was famous for having multiple children from multiple partners. Um, Almost all of his children are from mistresses. So none of them are actually from his legal wife, aka the first lady of North Korea, even Kim Jong-un. His mom was a mistress. Kim Jong-nam, his mom was a mistress. But he was well known for a lot of interesting things. Like a lot of interesting economic choices that would lead to some of the worst famines that North Korea has ever seen, as far as we know. Between 200,000 and three and a half million citizens starved to death under his rule. We don't have a more precise number because North Korea isn't exactly transparent about that kind of stuff but also there's alleged torture human rights violations insane propaganda i mean there's a whole deep dive in our uni episode that i will link below but he just didn't seem 
he just didn't seem to care about his people. Of course, he just seemed so focused on which one of his kids would take his seat. It's like the real life succession, just a lot more fatal and deadly and terrifying. He thought most of his kids were not suitable for the job. On a train to Russia, he got into a conversation with some fellow passengers about his kids. What kind of passenger? Uh, probably like a North Korean or North Korean officials and Russian officials. Okay. And like most fathers do, he said, "My sons are idle blockheads," which people thought was humorous because they do have quite square-shaped faces. He said, "My sons are idle blockheads. My daughters are the ones who have the real minds, power, and intellect to be in politics." But misogyny wins because ultimately the transfer of power would go to his son and not his daughter. His youngest son, Kim Jong Un, would be the next supreme leader. He is the current reigning dictator over North Korea, which is very interesting because Kim Jong Un has two older brothers that would make more sense to be heir. And also, his younger sister is known to be the political powerhouse. She's known to be the deadliest woman in North Korea. She is freaking terrifying. She's said to be the brains of the regime. She's said to be the ones pulling the purse strings behind him. But none of them got it. He won. Was he just the smartest, most capable, most politically agile? Not really. So Kim Jong Nam was first. He had the whole Disneyland issue, right? Then Kim Jong Un had a full-blooded brother that was a couple years older than him, and this is like his full brother, not a half brother. Mm -hmm. He was supposed to be next. He's the second eldest son. But uh, Kim Jong Il took one look at that guy uh -huh. and said, "Pass, just." Apparently, and this is a direct quote, Chol, the second son, has the warm heart of a little girl. Yeah, that's what wow. he said. So apparently the second son went to the same school in Switzerland that Kim Jong-nam and Kim Jong-un would go to in Switzerland. They actually had an aunt and uncle in Switzerland that would take these kids in, send them to school, be their guardians, and then send them back to North Korea after their schooling. This is also the Kim's way of getting insight into the Western world and allegedly spying. I don't know how much you can spy as like a high schooler, but yeah, allegedly spying. So this kid told everyone that his name was Park. So the second son told everyone at school that his name was Park. And he was the son of a driver at the North Korean embassy. And he was, um, he was really chill. People said that Park would crack jokes all the time. He had a really cool sense of humor. And he was really good friends with all of the South Korean kids in the school. Like just, he liked video games. He was decent at sports. The only weird thing about Park that everyone remembered is that he would never eat cafeteria food. And the cafeteria food in Switzerland is not like in the US. Like you're talking fancy boarding school cafeteria food. You're talking catering food. He would never eat it. Literally, he would bring his own meals, never touch a single thing of anybody else's food. Very fascinating. Interesting. Why would you do that? They also said that he was a huge pacifist, which is kind of an interesting philosophy for the son of a North Korean dictator. In class, he wrote a poem called A World That I Dream Of. And his dream world, according to his poem, was a world without guns, nuclear weapons, wars, terrorists, or religion. Everything was secular and peaceful and open. Is he still alive? Yeah. Yeah, you would think that he's not, but he's alive hmm. because he's not a threat. Their dad hated the fact that um, he would see his two sons, his youngest two sons, Park and Chung Un, and they would play basketball, right? Which I don't think most North Koreans can do, but he's part of the Kim dynasty. Should you just say Chung Un, like Kim Chung Un? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I'm just calling him Chung Un, -y, like he's my friend or yeah, something. Yeah, weird, it's weird. Honey. Okay, yeah. Kim Chung Un, okay. So then um, the second son would say things like, We did good, guys. We did well after they lose. Meanwhile, Kim Chung Un would rage. And his dad was like, I like that one. Oh. I like the one that's raging. I like the one that can't process emotions. So his dad passed on the second son being the next leader. Didn't even give him a, didn't even give the second son a second glance, okay? But he was fine with it. He never wanted the seat of power. He just wanted to live his life. Because at the end of the day, the Kim dynasty, they're billionaires. So he's living his dream, traveling the world, going to Eric Clapton concerts, which is like a blues guitarist. He plays guitar in a band. He lives in Pyongyang, and he just tries to steer clear of his brother's bad side. It's said that after Kim Jong-un took power, he's just basically Kim Jong-un's baby, even though he's his older brother. And he just likes to use some money to get some girls and hang out. Kim Jong-un does not even consider him a threat, even though technically he could challenge his brother's rule. So if the heir can't be Disneyland Nam 
or chill second son. It's got to be the only other son. Forget the intelligent, terrifying, frightening daughter. We need a man. So Kim Jong-un it is. And it's said that allegedly, Kim Jong-un's mom, who happened to also be a mistress, was the one who tipped the police off in Tokyo about Nam's fake passport when he arrived. She allegedly knew that Nam was in line for succession, and if he was internationally embarrassed, Kim Jong-il would never allow him to take over. If Kim Jong-il chose one of her sons, she would go from mistress to mother of the dictator. Also, her bloodline would be half of the royal bloodline in North Korea. So in North Korea, there is no voting, obviously. Um, no one really gets to choose which Kim is the most competent at taking over. As long as you have 50% of the royal Kim blood, meaning you are a child of one of the Kim members, you can go for the throne. You have a chance. So that's why even though she's a mistress, her son can be the next, I don't want to say king, but technically. And I think that she had been eyeing this for a while now. It said that ever since Kim Jong-un was born, she would call him my little general, which is a scary thing to call your child. And this isn't that important, but just to give you some insight on this guy and how unhinged his upbringing was, guards would be forced to inspect his food, which makes sense in case of an assassination attempt. But he also had dedicated guards to handle his toilet. They wouldn't flush it. His dad, the dictator, was very picky and was very paranoid that someone would steal his poop and study it like a foreign power, would somehow steal the poops of his kids. Study... The poop. For what? We don't know. I don't know what you get out of poop, okay? So what are they doing with the poop? I don't know. They had like a secret way of disposing of their poops. So regardless, Kim Jong-un takes power, but there's still other people, other relatives that could challenge his rule anytime if they wanted to. Namely, his brother Kim Jong-nam and his uncle Chang song Thik. Okay, we're going to call him Uncle Jay. Uncle Jay was Kim Jong-un's dad's right-hand man, and he has half the royal blood in him. They were brothers after all. But now that his dad was dead and he was in power, Kim Jong-un felt really uneasy having his uncle just hang around. Because technically, he's got 50% of the royal blood. He can be the king or whatever. He's got decades of experience in the government since he was the old dictator's right-hand man and people are familiar with him. There were even rumors going around that Uncle Jay was pulling the strings behind Kim Jong-un. So what does he do? He wants him out of the picture. He grabs two of Uncle Jay's closest advisors and publicly executes them with anti-aircraft guns. These are anti-aircraft guns, which means they have insane range. That means a bullet comes out of an insanely high speeds and the bullet itself is hard enough to do damage to a, like a moving armored metal object. Imagine what it does to a human body. And they mm -hmm. publicly executed Uncle Jay's two closest advisors. They were torn to shreds in front of everyone. It wasn't even just one bullet. It was like 50-something bullets. They were ripped apart publicly. They kept firing until their body was literally combusting into pieces. In a situation like this, wives would typically have to gather their remains off the ground, every single piece, and bury them in pieces. But they weren't even allowed to do that. The biggest insult is that they were taken and cremated after which is like a big thing in North Korea. I guess it's like an insult. So Uncle Jay collapsed during the execution. He fainted from the stress and grief because yes, those were probably his two closest friends, but he knew he was next. And he knew that there was no stopping his nephew. There was nothing. 10 days after his advisor's execution, <laughs> Uncle Jay was arrested. Before this, he was a perfectly healthy man, but when he was brought out for his public execution, people saw severe bruising all around his eyes and his body, scarred cuts all around his hands and his mouth. He was allegedly tortured during his time in prison, and the executioner told the crowd that Uncle Jay was convicted of treason. They did not provide any more specifics and or proof. They turned the guns on Uncle Jay and fired at him for three minutes straight in front of a crowd of people. The crowd literally could not distinguish Uncle Jay's body from the piles of dirt and dust around him at the time that they stopped firing. He had been turned to dust. And in North Korea, if you get arrested, so do your closest family members. After the execution, Uncle Jay's sister, so Kim Jong-un's aunt, her husband, and every single one of their kids were arrested. Allegedly, Kim just wanted to wipe out all of his side of the family because of the bloodline, which means claim to the throne issue. Kim Jong-un no longer had a threat of his uncle or his uncle's family taking over. His brother, calm, 
Kalm's second brother made it very clear that he didn't want the throne and Kim Jong-nan had been disgraced. But disgraced is one thing and non-threatening is another. So Kim Jong-nam, after the whole Disneyland accident, he had a deal with his dad. His dad would pay him half a million dollars a year for him to just like roam about the world and have fun. He would just kind of travel from here and there and he was a little bit more global back in the day. But once Kim Jong-un, his little brother, took power, he stayed in China. There's a whole thing about this. In 2012, Kim Jong-un put out an assassination order against Kim Jong-nam, his half-brother. The only reason that we know this is because South Korea's CIA got a hold of this information. They gave it to South Korean legislators who then turned around and told the New York Times. <laughs> huh. okay. 2012? Yeah. So like five years earlier from it, his death. Exactly. Kim Jong-nam wrote a letter to his brother, the dictator, begging him to halt the assassination order. Uh, the whole letter was not released, but some parts say, please withdraw the order to punish me and my family. We have nowhere to hide. There is no way out except to choose to end it ourselves. So by this point, he's pretty much stationed in China. Kim Jong-nam has nowhere else to go but China. He cannot go back to North Korea because his little brother dictator is probably going to kill him the minute that he steps foot in there. And everywhere else is not that safe. So compared to the rest of the world, China treats North Korea cordially and vice versa. China is also a very strong, formidable enemy. So Nam hoped that he was safe there because his brother, his brother had a fear of pissing off China. And if he went into China and assassinated Kim Jong-nam in China, you think Chinese government would be like, oh yeah, go on ahead, do whatever you want. They'd be pretty freaking pissed. Kim Jong-nam was hiding in China, in Macau, China to be exact, but there were a couple other family members that were in hiding. So there were some that defected to Russia these are like direct family members, not just like North Korean defectors, but um, a couple in the United States. Yeah, the U.S. is a big place, okay? They will shield you, and just like China, it would be very, very difficult for the North Korean dictator to come into the U.S. and kill their family member, if they wanted to, allegedly. So remember the aunt and uncle in Switzerland that would watch all of the Kim, Kim's kids while they went to school in Switzerland? Well, they decided that they didn't want anything to do with it anymore. Um, I, I don't really know. I feel like there must have been something that happened or something that instigated this or I don't know. Because while they are taking care of Kim Jong-un, so this guy's a teenager right now. He's in their Swiss house, going to the Swiss boarding school. They pack their bags in the middle of the night, take their kids and dip. They leave Kim Jong-un to wake up so confused what the hell had happened. They actually ended up flying to the U.S., um, getting help from the CIA to stay hidden. They went to the U.S. Embassy, requested asylum. U.S. granted it to them. They are now currently living in New York City. They've been completely anonymous um, just until a recent interview with the Washington Post. They will not share their new names or their faces, but we do know that they're running a dry cleaning business and they're getting ready to pass it on to their kids after they retire. None of them want a single thing to do with their cousins or their nephew's regime. And it's speculated that's why Kim Jong-un constantly threatens to blow up Manhattan, because he hates his aunt and uncle. But besides that Washington Post interview, they have stayed dead silent. Even in the Washington Post, they really didn't say anything. They just said, we want nothing to do with North Korea. We're just trying to move on with our lives. That's pretty much it. On the other hand, Kim Jong-nam in China wasn't laying as low. I don't think that he was instigating anything. I don't think he was poking the bear, but he would travel around Europe and in Paris, I believe, he was stopped by a bunch of paparazzi who were like reporters and journalists who were asking like, what do you think about what your brother just did? What do you think about your brother being in power? What do you think about North Korea right now? And for the most part, Kim Jong-nam did not talk to them. On the few occasions that he did talk to them, however, he always truthfully expressed his opinion and it was almost always negative. So for Nam to put his own negative opinion opinion out there was a very dangerous thing to do and I'm not exactly sure why he did that maybe he wanted to get the truth out there somehow to help the citizens or I don't know maybe he thought that his brother was just like a little brother like whatever little tongue saying I can say what I want I have no idea what did he say he would just say things like yeah I don't like what's going on over there it's crazy it caught up to him though six months before his death he told his friends that he was afraid for his life he believed his brother wanted to kill him so this is in 2017. His brother originally wanted to kill him in 2012, remember? But for some reason, he chose not to. Maybe he felt like Kim Jong-nam was pathetic and not a threat to his throne, just hiding out in China. Was it because of what he said to the press or the paparazzi? I literally can't believe that I'm talking about North Korean paparazzi right now. 
Probably not. The speculation is that allegedly in 2017, Kim Jong Nam started working with the CIA. Why do people think that? During Kim Jong Nam's vacation in Malaysia, he flew to a resort island in the northern part of Malaysia and checked into a Westin hotel. It is worth noting that a Westin hotel is a very American hotel chain that is a branch of the Marriott Hotels, a very American company. CCTV camera caught him getting into an elevator with a man that North Korea suspected to be a CIA employee. They had a two hour meeting in Malaysia. Between him possibly working with the CIA and bowed mouthing North Korea to the media, there is more than enough motive for Kim Jong un to hypothetically, allegedly, I'm not saying this is true, want his brother dead. So, not saying he did it, but hypothetically, how would he go about something like this, right? How would he go about doing something like this? Kim Jong un is said to be one for theatrics. I mean, look at the way that he executed his own uncle. And we know that his brother Nam was safe in China. And if he was working with the CIA, maybe Nam felt some sort of protection from them too. So Kim Jong-un needed to move quickly because what if Kim Jong-nam was getting ready to be moved to the US? He needed the perfect plan to kill him publicly so the whole world would know, not just Kim Jong-nam, but it would send out a message. This is what a lot of experts believe. It would send out the message. An enemy of North Korea is not safe anywhere, anytime, or with anyone, even if you work with the CIA. Allegedly, Kim Jong-un hatched his assassination plot, and everything that I'm about to say is alleged, by the way. There were eight North Korean spies that were part of the assassination plot. Now, if a North Korean spy killed Nam, it would be too obvious who did it, and maybe Nam would even suspect a spy. They moved different. He knew what to look out for in a North Korean spy. He would be ready. He'd know exactly how to react. He had vials of the antidote. He would probably take the antidote right away. Now, for a job like this, hypothetically, they would need someone that was unassuming, someone that could be easily looked over, someone that Nam would never be suspicious of. Women, average, gullible, easy to blend in women, were the orders given to the spies. Now, I'm not saying that today's two women are these things, but at this stage in their lives, I would say that they weren't as established in their careers or their social circles yet. They were quite vulnerable. Now, set the scene. They can't just kill Nam in China. It would be a diplomatic nightmare. And China is the only country, really, that North Korea really cares about because of their trade relationship. When Nam flew to Malaysia, it was the perfect time. Which, side note, North Korea doesn't have a bad relationship with Malaysia either. So Malaysia is one of those countries who aren't specifically hostile towards North Korea. Like the U.S. is specifically hostile. South Korea is specifically hostile, you know? Um, mm -hmm. Malaysia is not. They actually have a North Korean embassy in Malaysia. So getting the spies into Malaysia, super easy. But killing Nam in the dark in his hotel room would be boring. Would it even make international news? Wow. Would people even really talk about it? Would, people, would it instill fear in enemies' hearts? Probably not. They would have to do it public, in broad daylight, in the middle of an airport where you genuinely feel a sense of security because there's so many people. There's so many people who have places to go that don't care about you. There's so many cameras. The rough sketch of the hypothetical alleged don't kill me plan goes like this. One of the eight North Korean spies that were tasked with Nam's assassination would go and recruit actresses. Uh, the real situation was that three of them did, right? James, Mr. Chang, Mr. Y. They would need two actresses because of the two components of the VX. They already had this all planned out. They will tell the girls that they have a YouTube prank channel that's rapidly growing and they need actresses to help carry out some of these pranks. They will do a few test pranks throughout the month or two months and they will pay the girls for all of this. They will continue to do the tests and amp it up and make their story believable. Then they will move on to the real target, the North Korean dictator's brother, a man who could challenge the reign of power. Each of the eight spies had a role to play. The recruiter will meet with the girls, meeting them, briefing them. Others will monitor the target, keep an eye out on his whereabouts. Another one would be waiting just outside the doors in a car, just in case. And another one would secure all of them a seat on a flight that would leave the country immediately afterwards. Not the girls, though. The girls didn't get a seat on the flight. The girls will just have to go down as the highly trained, politically motivated evil assassins that took down the North Korean Kim family member. Because, I mean, they're the ones putting oil on his face in broad daylight, caught on CCTV camera. So they had to go down for it and only made sense. After Nam went to the airport medical center, he passed out and was rushed to the local hospital. One interesting thing to note is during the commotions going on, like no one knows that Kim Jong Nam is in the airport medical center dying right now. No one's even walking by the medical center, except for a man with a black suitcase is walking by the window nonstop trying to peer in. It's said that he is probably one of the North Korean spies to see if it was successful. 
So authorities very quickly find out what had killed this man. VX had killed him. They waited nine days to announce it to the public, and the general public had no idea what VX was. But this assassination put it into the international spotlight, along with the suspicion that North Korea had a huge stockpile of VX. Side note, North Korea was very upset that Malaysia did an autopsy on Nam. He said that Nam was their citizen and Malaysia had no right. They said Malaysia had committed a violation on human rights for conducting an autopsy on one of their citizens without their consent. Wow. And the whole world said, I'm not really sure if North Korea is in the position to make human rights complaints. So Malaysia fired back and said, well, he died on our soil. So we have every single right and we will gladly send his body back to his country or to his family after the autopsy is fully done. Malaysia. Yeah. Nine days after the death, the Malaysian police reported a suspected break into the mortuary where Nam's body had been held. Is the body taken or? No, but uh, yeah. Six days after that, North Korea publicly announced that VX was not the cause of Nam's death. They said that he died of a heart attack evidenced by his history of cardiac issues. That's crazy. Like, everything's on camera. Yeah, but they're like, no, not in this country. Okay. So Malaysia was not having it. On March 2nd, they sent the North Korean ambassador an eviction notice, basically. They told him he had less than 48 hours to leave the country unless he wanted to be arrested. No. Then they banned visa-free entry for North Korean citizens. The next day, North Korea retaliated by banning any and all Malaysian citizens from leaving North Korea, effectively trapping them there. No. Then Malaysia did the same thing, trapping any North Koreans in Malaysia. There were nine Malaysian citizens in North Korea and an estimated 300 North Koreans in Malaysia. None of them were allowed to go home. The ban was relatively short. By the end of the month, it was lifted. But Malaysia and North Korea, they lifted the travel bans and they sent Nam's body back to North Korea along with his clothes and some other belongings. On the very same day, four North Korean men, four of the eight spies, James, the North Korean ambassador, and two others, they were on the same flight back to North Korea. Just like that. So they all got away. All got away. There is very little known about these men. Um, All we know is that they're in their 30s, 40s, 50s. They're North Korean spies. They made it safely to North Korea. And it's speculated that nothing happened to them. They still have their ranks and positions. Nothing happened to them at all. They just got on a plane and left. Meanwhile, as far as Sidi and Doan knew, they weren't even arrested the same day for the murder. They walked straight out of the airport after washing their hands. Hmm. They got out. They were looking for the spies or they were looking for their handlers. So basically the YouTubers, as you they're looking for, they can't find them. And they're thinking, okay, well, maybe the, the man got mad. So maybe they had to leave. Maybe the security guards came. They were chased off the premise. Either way, it's fine. It's happened before. Typically, I'll go home and they'll reach out to me again when they're ready to film another prank. So both of them went home. The two women went separately home. They're not suspicious at all. They don't even know who the guy that they just touched all over the face was. They waited for the next call for another prank. Meanwhile, the police are combing through the airport security footage. They're working around the clock to identify and locate the woman. Airport security footage showed them running up to Nam and putting their hands on him. And it also caught them running to the bathroom afterwards. They get clear images of these girls' faces. And now all they had to do was find them. Two days after the attack, Doan gets a text message from Mr. Y. He said that the video at the airport had done so well that he wanted to film the exact same one at the exact same place. He told her to meet him at the airport. Doan got dressed, did her makeup for the cameras, slipped on the same pair of shoes, waited at the airport. He never showed up. Oh he never God. showed up. She texted him and it said text message cannot be delivered to this number. So she tried calling him. Number wasn't going through. She waited a while and then she decided to leave. She didn't even make it out of the airport parking lot or the little entrance area. The taxi was stopped by the airport police and suddenly, don't, she's Vietnamese. All she knew are these people screaming at her, demanding her answers in Malay. She doesn't speak the language. She's confused. Why are they so upset? Why are they so upset at her? Wow. Why are these men in uniform yelling at her? Have I done something wrong? Damn, this Bef- poor girl is like... Oh, oh I can't even God. begin. Malaysian police had arrested her and taken a mugshot photo of her. She still had no idea why they were doing this. Meanwhile, Sidi had gone back to Indonesia and was in her room with her roommate when the police came for her. They barged down the door. Where were you Friday, February 13th? What? February? I was at the airport with my boss, Mr. Chang. 
They brought her in, asked her more questions, and with every question she could not answer, she just saw them get angrier and angrier and more frustrated. And it was just, she was so confused. Like, why do you care about what little old village girl me was doing on the freaking 13th? Like, I don't even work for a big corporation. Like, what is, I don't work for the government. What's going on? And they're like, who's your boss? Mr. Chang. Oh, yeah? Mr. Chang? Why don't you call Mr. Chang? So he's like, okay, yeah, fine. She pulls out her phone and dials his number, and there were three beeps, and the automated voice said, I'm sorry, this number is no longer available. Goodbye. The police turned to her, and they were smiling. So the police, they went in with the presumption that this is like a North Korean spy. Oh. You know, not like a little old girl who has no idea what's going on, but probably a spy who's acting like they have no idea what's going on. Mm, so they think they caught a big fish. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And she's like, no, 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 please. I was just texting him. I swear I have all the messages. Who are you? Are you a spy? And she's like, a spy? This is the last thing on her mind. You've arrested me because you think I'm a spy? Like, Maybe I ran a red light, but you think you think I'm a spy? No, absolutely. What do you, you? That doesn't even make sense. And they're explaining to her, "What did you do at the airport at the man with the man who died?" This is when she finds out, the man's face that she touched. That man, he died. They said you were involved in a premeditated murder of a president's brother. You are under arrest for first degree murder. CD was so confused that she thought she was being pranked. For a hot minute, she genuinely believed that this was a new YouTube video and she was now the person that was being pranked. So she even let out a couple nervous laughs, which only pissed off authorities even more. She even straight up asked at one point, like, is this a prank? And she kind of looked around for cameras and the guys in uniforms were looking at her like she was absolutely insane. She found out that it was not a prank when she was dragged to her cell. She glanced to her right and she saw the face of the other actress that had been there two days ago at the airport and that just cemented in her mind, wait a minute, it probably is a prank then, right? Wait, where are they now? In jail. Where? In Malaysia. Oh, oh, she got pulled back? Uh Oh, wow. So then she's like, okay, maybe it is a prank because the other actress is here. That night, I mean, she went through a roller coaster of emotions. That night, she realized, it's, okay, there's no way it's a prank because I'm still in here. No one's here. There's no cameras. Mr. Chang is not popping out of the woodworks. I'm still sitting in prison. And back at home, her parents had the scare of her lives. Not only were these two girls, their mugshots blasted internationally and they were being called female assassins, her family was so understandably confused, heartbroken, and frightened. They did not believe for a single second that she was a female assassin. But in the span of a few days, they found out about everything. The crime, the arrest, the work, everything. And their hearts broke. They weren't even mad. They just, their hearts broke for their daughter. Both girls were kept side by side in secluded cells away from the general population because they were awaiting trial. And if convicted, they could be sentenced to death. So in America, death penalty cases are long. They're drawn out, increasing the time that the prisoners can appeal. In Malaysia, the death sentence is, I don't want to say, but like the way that it's described online is more or less automatic. So if convicted, the chance of execution is a lot more of a guarantee than in America. Whereas in America, even if you're convicted and you're sentenced to death, there are so many appeals. There are so many states who don't, you know, execute anymore. First degree murder in Malaysia, the automatic punishment oftentimes is death penalty. And executions are often carried out, not secretly, but with no legal responsibility on the government's part to let the prisoner or their family know. It's normal for you to get a two-day heads up that you're going to be executed. So it's very hard to appeal, whereas there's a lot of appealing in the U.S. So these girls are straight up staring death in the face. And if they were to be executed, the guards would lead them to the gallows, tie sandbags to their feet, and push them off the ledge. Like, hanging. I don't even know how someone can process that. It just feels so unreal. Everything just doesn't feel real. And like, the the YouTube prank element just, it almost feels like a like an SNL skit. It Yeah. It's not even it doesn't feel real. It feels so fake and so caricature and like contrived. It it's bizarre. The joint trial began October of 2017 and both of the girls pleaded not guilty and they stuck to their story about I genuinely thought this was a YouTube prank. 
the Indonesian and Vietnamese governments hired defense teams for both of the girls. Wow. Now, this is where it gets crazy and a lot of politics gets involved. The prosecution started off with, there is no evidence of a political plot. It's not important for us to prove. So that was already setting the tone of, we are not trying to prove someone else did it. All we know, and they kept stating, we have this evidence that you guys touched his face with chemicals on your hands and he died. They're just saying like, we don't have proof that or evidence that Kim Jong-un killed his brother or ordered his brother to be killed, but we have proof that you guys smeared his face with VX. They also argued that it was premeditated as the girls had been practicing for this for a month in advance by smearing other people's faces with baby oil and baby lotion. They said that the girls must have known that the chemical was toxic because they went to the bathroom immediately to wash their hands. CCTV cameras also show them going to the bathrooms without touching themselves, their clothes, or their belongings. In fact, their hand is like pretty far away from the rest of their body. But the girls argued we were told that it was going to stain our clothes. Like what kind of person wants to actively stain your clothes? There's CCTV evidence of them committing the crimes. Um, there's also evidence, allegedly, that they had VX byproducts on CD shirt. People were confused by this, okay? So CD was the one that went first. So she should only have one component of VX, but they were alleging that she had both components on her shirt. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, her shirt was destroyed accidentally after it tested positive for VX. So at the opening statements, I mean, the prosecutors made their statement and one journalist in the audience remembered writing down in his notebook just a single line. He was there to take notes on all of this. He just wrote, they are f The girls? Yeah. Because it looks like everyone has made up their minds on how this is going to go right now. CD's defense pointed out all the inconsistencies with her wanting to kill someone. CD had documented all of her meetings with James. She thought she was showing the behind the scenes of her actress life. She documented extensively. Why would she record her work if she knew that she was working as an assassin and exposing a North Korean spy? Yeah. Like, what the hell? CD's shirt that was also said to have VX, like, why was it missing now? Why can you not find it? And she shouldn't have VX because she was the first one to touch his face. Doan's defense team, who was hired by the Vietnamese government, they also sent two Vietnamese ambassadors as translators. They said that she didn't touch anything with her hands afterwards, not because she knew it was VX, but because she didn't want to get her clothes dirty. And she came back to the scene of the crime two days later for another yeah. video. If she truly did know that she had killed a man and a dictator's brother, you think that returning to the scene of the crime just so happens to be on her to-do list? Yeah. Were there security guards, people, police officers, international law enforcement where a murder had just taken place and CCTV cameras? Like, you think that's something that she would like to do? Meanwhile, they also pointed out the North Korean spies that they worked with changed their clothes and fled the scene quickly. Four of the eight had left the country two hours of the, after the incident. The other four waited for Kim Jong-nam's body. Yeah. Oh, they're taking the body. Yeah. Meanwhile, these two girls, they didn't really have any sort of escape plan they weren't in a rush to get anywhere they went back home they were just doing regular things so there seems to be a lot of speculation um that malaysia did not necessarily want to accuse kim jong-un of murdering his brother and it's not just malaysia i don't want anyone to come after malaysia because internationally no one was people were connecting the dots people were saying alleged but no one was like he did it we should put them on trial we should bring the spies and it was just kind of like, we think that it was um, an inside job. Malaysia's economy took a massive hit after this, which again, they didn't want to be involved. Why are they involved in this, right? Their airport was turned into an international crime scene. It just sucked as a whole. Their citizens were impacted by something that they had no part of. It was an international diplomatic nightmare. Side note, North Korea was not being tried. I just want to make that very clear. But they did hire an infamous Malaysian defense attorney who would show up to the trial and basically state, from A to Z, this case is the product of reckless moves of the United States and South Korean authorities. Hmm? And everyone was like, what? So they're basically saying that the U.S. and South Korea are spreading propaganda that Kim Jong-un was involved. They're trying to tarnish North Korea's image and bring down its social system. I suppose they just wanted a voice in the matter. North Korea refused to admit that Kim Jong-nam was related to Kim Jong-un in any way. They also said in any official reports or any official statements that he was just a North Korean citizen. That's how they referred to him. They also deny everything about the eight spies. So both of the girls, they're standing on the ledge between life and death for something that they didn't 
even do technically, right? Maybe, I don't know, legally. Like they didn't even claim that they knew that they were doing that. And these two girls, they became sisters in their cells. They were right next to each other and they don't speak the same language. CD didn't even know Doan's name. She just knew that she came from Hanoi, Vietnam. So she calls her Noi. And anytime they would have their lunch or their dinner delivered to their cells, she would call out, CD, and then she would say, Noi, I'm here, let's eat. And they would eat their meals together. Doan said, only I understand her and only she understands me. We became sisters. We became best friends. When we were together, I felt her heart. CD said that those two years in prison, they were in prison for two years during the trial, were probably the darkest times of her life. She said that she prayed almost every day to go back to her home country and nobody knew what was going to happen. After two very long years, CD was released and all charges were dropped. It came out of nowhere. It CD was not expecting it. It was blindsided, honestly. She thought that she was going to go back to jail with Nori, with Doan, but she wasn't. So it turns out the Indonesian government did not really care about North Korea. They uh -huh. didn't really care about their diplomatic relations. Um, they made a few lucrative negotiations with Malaysia, and the Indonesian pr president had personally gotten involved in these negotiations. But when it was all said and done, CD walked out of the courtroom as a free woman. Doan, on the other hand, had to return to prison that night. She had to wear a bulletproof vest on her way because her lawyers were afraid of North Korea's retaliation against CD's release. Her lawyer said, in all my 37 years of law, not once was my client required to wear a bulletproof vest. In these type of situations, you are just a grain of sand in this, this case. Yes. You're so and it's, you know, all these governments are trying to protect international relationships, which I understand because no one wants a war, no one wants an attack, because that would be more people in harm. But the fact that you are just collateral, whatever happens to you to mm -hmm. maintain the status quo is not important. And the only reason that CD got out was because Indonesia did not care to have a relationship with North Korea. So they put a lot on the line and negotiated with Malaysia. Vietnam, on the other hand, they weren't as in a lucky position. I have no doubt that Vietnam wanted to help Doan as much as they could, but I think that they were afraid of making North Korea angry. And I think that each country has their own very sensitive relationships with different countries and it was just very hard. So they couldn't work as hard. They still paid for all of her legal defense attorneys and all of that, but they just couldn't go out and be so brazen. And finally, the judge released the sentence. Doan would plead guilty and she would be sentenced to three years and four months in prison. This is a much lesser charge than what she was looking at, which was first degree premeditated murder, which would probably come with the death penalty. She was also allowed parole after serving the majority of her sentence. So after the trial, she spent a little over two years in prison. She got out a month after her verdict. She went back home and she was finally a free woman. And side note, this is freaking crazy. But uh, both of the girls knew that they probably killed someone important. They did not know they killed Kim Jong-un's brother until after the trial. So during the entire trial, they still went by the fake passport name, his alias, Mr. Chol. Why? I don't know. I guess maybe the girls weren't supposed to. I don't know why. It was all out in international news, but because they were in prison, they were not told. Very strange. But CD said when she got out of prison, she was told that it was Kim Jong-un's brother. And she just didn't even know how to process that information. She did not know that she had unwillingly murdered the half-brother to the most powerful man in North Korea and potentially one of the scariest men in the entire world. And as for Kim Jong-nam, his wife and children were in China. It is speculated maybe they're in the U.S. now under um, witness protection. I don't know where they are, okay, but... um. Kim Jong-nam's son went on an interview a couple days after Kim Jong-nam's death, which is insane. But he said, uh, my father had been killed a few days ago. I'm currently with my mom and sister. My father has been killed a few days ago. Uh, I'm currently with uh, my mother and my sister. He talked about his childhood and gave his thoughts on North Korea. He said that he dreams of unification of Korea. He said he one day wants to go back to North Korea and improve the social and living environments of North Korean citizens. He said that when he was in Macau and studying abroad, he made a lot of friends from South Korea. And he talked about how after learning about their life experience and their country, he supports South Korea. He's friends with South Koreans and that has made him change his own political beliefs. 
He's saying this only a few days after his father was allegedly assassinated by North Korea for doing the same exact thing. So, um, very scary. A lot of people like him, though. Some people are cheering him on and calling him the Prince of North Korea, and they hope that he will become the next president of North Korea and steer the country in a good direction since he seems to have a rational mind to weigh arguments from both sides. And I'm not sure if we should encourage that because it seems like any leader of North Korea has a history of assassinating potential threats to their power. But people do believe that Kim Han Sol, the son, is being shielded by the CIA and is in witness protection in the United States. But I don't know. No one knows why he came out and did that interview. Some people think that he wants to come out and tell his uncle, I'm alive and well, and you can't get me. It's just a very, very dangerous thing to do. Kim Jong-un has no apparent heir as of right now, though he reportedly does have a son. He has also debuted his daughter multiple times during like a like nuclear test of all places. She's 10. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people think that Kim Han Sol could be a strong contender for the throne. And we see what happens when that happens. So there's just so much craziness in today's story. I don't even know where to put this, but it's also speculated that Kim Jong Nam and Kim Jong Un never met in person. The two brothers, they never met in person. So apparently the Kims practice the ancient tradition of raising potential successors separately. They never let them meet, Mm -hmm. even if they're brothers or half-brothers. It said the brothers were kept apart for most of their lives. I don't know about the second brother in Kim Jong-un. Maybe they met when they were like in high school. But for a good chunk, they don't meet. Mm -hmm. Some sources say all of that's a lie and they met once at the father's funeral. Some people say no, they went to the father's funeral separately and did not run into each other. But I guess only the brothers know if they've met. But it doesn't seem like we have any solid proof that they have which would make this even more bizarre. This is a story of how two girls, thinking that they were going to be YouTubers, killed the brother of one of the most terrifying dictators on the entire planet right now. You might be wondering, why the hell didn't I hear about it? Or why do I only have a vague recollection of this? Same. Did North Korea wipe the story from all media outlets? Actually, the United States did that. But not even on purpose. They didn't mean to, of course. This crime happened one month into Trump's term as president. And since he had won by electoral vote rather than by popular vote, it made his whole presidency very historic. And as you guys know, there was so much conversation surrounding it and so much controversy surrounding his presidency. So it was all kind of drowned out. It was like front page news for like a second and then everything else was about Trump. So I think that's why a lot of people don't talk about it or maybe they're scared and maybe I'm an idiot and I'm like putting my life on danger right now. The girls seem to be doing good now though. They gave a few interviews. Um, They're working to try and retire their parents and cope with the new reality. Doan is back in Vietnam and her village had surprised her with this huge party when she got back but they still keep in touch and they refer to each other as their sisters. CD still calls Doan Noi, a reminder of where it literally felt like just the two of them against the world. And they said that their bond is unbreakable. And that is the very, very terrifying case of today. What are your thoughts? I don't even know what to say. I didn't know like the full extent. I think I got bits and pieces. Like when it was unfolding, I kept hearing like female assassins. So I thought, okay, female North Korean spies. Mm -hmm. And then it started unfolding more. And I was like, okay, I don't know what's truth and what's fact. Because when people would say, oh, I think it was for a YouTube video. Because it was talked a little bit more in South Korea, obviously in the news. Like I think they thought it was for like a video or some sort of like variety show. I was like, that sounds like an urban legend. That sounds like Mm -hmm. a conspiracy or a lie. No. So, what are your thoughts? Please stay safe. I guess for this episode, I'll say that to myself. Please stay safe. And I will see you guys on Sunday for the mini-sode. Bye.